All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining today's webinar, State of the Consumer, Halloween in a Haunted Year, presented by Susie and the candy industry. Uh, this is definitely our most niche vertical State of the Consumer webinar we've done. This is now our 13th uh, State of the Consumer webinar we've done since the month of March, since our company at Suzy, like everybody undoubtedly who's watching and listening today, has gone remote. Um, we are distributed all over the U.S., uh, more than 100 employees now at Suzy. Um, it's been a very interesting, very challenging, but also um, very invigorating year for the Suzy team. And I hope everybody um, out there is is feel, faring as well as possible through this. So today, hopefully, we'll have a little bit of fun um, talking about Halloween. And joining me um, is Crystal Lindell from Candy Industry. Crystal, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate having such a great uh, deep domain industry expert to join us on this fun topic. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. Absolutely. Um, so Crystal, why don't you tell us a little bit, first of all, about Candy Industry, what you guys do, and a little bit about your background. Yeah, so Candy Industry covers the entire confectionery industry. We're a B2B magazine that covers everything from supply chain all the way to retail and everything in between. Um, we cover manufacturing trends, flavor trends, ingredient trends, um, manufacturing techniques, and also retail innovations and things like that. So we have a pretty good grasp on you know the entire industry, I'd like to think. Uh, I have a journalism background, and I've been on this magazine now for about 10 years. Gotcha. Great. So you've obviously seen everything uh, you can think of to hit the candy industry. I'm sure this year is unlike no other, and we're going to get into some different themes. So really curious, as I know so much of our audience is, to hear what you think about everything's going on and get really your um, insider expertise. Uh, for those of you who don't know what Suzy is, uh, Suzy is a real-time market research platform. Um, we are built to help companies make faster, better, more data-driven decisions um, and is a tool now used by over 250 leading enterprise companies across the United States, including many companies that are in uh, the confectionery space, as well as the broader food and beverage space. Uh, we have conducted specific research that's going to be fueling this webinar today. Um, today's uh, webinar is fueled by research conducted on September 8th with a sample size of 1,000 Americans, inclusive of 500 parents, uh, and the sample size reference today is directionally representative of U.S. consumers and census weighted across age, gender, ethnicity, and region. So with that out of the way, I um, want to just start with some just more high level topics um, impacting the candy industry, Crystal. And you may have seen this story, but uh, the New York Post I read, you know, um, talked about how the city of Berkeley, California banned candy from supermarket checkout aisles, which undoubtedly has to be a huge distribution point for the candy industry. Is this sort of the tip of an, uh, the iceberg for challenges at retail on top of obviously e-commerce disruption the candy industry is going through? Is, do you think this is the first of many cities to kind of follow the lead here? Yeah, I mean, they're actually following the lead of, you know, companies like Aldi already did this a few years ago. So they have done this uh, for a while now. And it is a huge disruption to the candy industry because a lot of sales are uh, at the checkout. And that's not only a huge revenue source for the candy companies, but also the grocery stores because they tend to have a pretty good profit margin on those products. Um, yeah. I mean, personally, ideally, you'd want to see grocery stores kind of do maybe candy free aisles or candy mixed with other things like, you know, maybe healthy protein bars and also batteries and things like that. Um, sure. So completely ban it, it is difficult, but like you said, um, e-commerce is a much bigger disruption because, you know, grabbing a candy bar at checkout doesn't have to happen in the same way when you're buying groceries online. Um, and so that's, course. that's been on everybody's mind. The other thing is at checkout, um, you know, a few years ago, everybody was very stressed about self-check but they've done a lot to kind of get a handle on that and set them up in ways that have candy like at the checkout still and things like that. So they kind of worked around that. But then, yeah, you are seeing, you know, grocery stores do things like this. Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting because the pandemic obviously I think caused sort of like a bifurcated impact on the candy industry. On one hand, grocery shopping just obtained massive adoption. And to your point, when you're buying groceries online, you're not at the checkout aisle. Maybe you're not thinking about candy as sort of one of the core pillars of what you're shopping, shopping for for groceries. So it had to impact it. On the other hand, you know, we're seeing lots of companies, including PepsiCo, which announced their quarterly earnings yesterday, talk about how snacks and sodas 
have been thriving during the pandemic as consumers are home more, seeking out more comfort food. So it seems like there's an increase in demand. Are you saying that specifically in the candy industry as well? Yeah, I mean, um, some of the early data showed that chocolate was the top quarantine snack food, the top comfort yeah. food that people were reaching for. So that, I mean, I guess is good for the candy industry under, you know, sad terms, I guess you could say. Yeah. Um, I think, you, like you said, a lot of people are home more, a lot of people are working at home more, and it's really changed how people eat throughout the day. They're snacking on stuff that's, you know, right in their home kitchen. Um, ideally, you're hoping that it encourages people to buy snacks in more of a bulk way instead of, you know, the vending machine or checkout way. Because sure. that helps people have them in the house. And it also um, can help with like e-commerce issues, like you said, where if you're buying like a bag of Hershey's candy bars or whatever, um, you're more likely to think to put that in your cart when you're doing- Of course, e no one's gonna order one Snickers bar on Amazon to get delivered like yeah. they may do. We may pick up at 7-Eleven. So totally understand the channel challenges that I think this industry is gonna face. And of course, you know, the, the, the challenges with just the healthcare, health related concerns, obesity concerns, and how does the candy industry adopt much like, you know, the soda industry has had to adopt as well. So um, obviously lots of headwinds, but in some ways lots of opportunities and obviously no decrease in demand uh, as we just spoke of. So today we're gonna talk about Halloween, which obviously is huge. How big is Halloween for the candy industry? Those of you who are watching from the candy industry, you probably know this, but we have people from all sorts of different industries that are on this Zoom call right now. So tell us, how big is it, Crystal? Um, well, it's one of the major holidays of the year. I think it's over $4 billion in profit, typically for the confectionery industry each year. Um, so it's a huge deal. Some of the larger candy companies, you'll see them planning for this years in advance. Um, products for these types of holidays in the industry, we see them introduced a year in advance. So wow. there's a lot that goes into it. And uh, a lot of people have had to think on their feet this year. So I'm interested to talk about that more as we continue on. Yeah. And what percentage of volume for a large scale candy company does Halloween make up? Yeah. So Hershey has said that 10% of their annual sales are from uh, Halloween sales and about 5% of those are trick or treating. Gotcha. So uh, big we'll, number. Yeah. We're going to yeah. see what happens this year. But yeah. Yeah. Five to 10% of your sales happening on a single day of the year. So Super Bowl of the candy industry. And obviously the Halloween's the one day of the year that we all wear masks until obviously this year, because now it seems like we're wearing masks every single year, every single day of this year. So obviously getting dressed up and wearing masks um, is not something that will be new uh, during Halloween. Um, and you know, Halloween we think is the one day, obviously we would knock on strangers door for candy, but maybe not this year. So some of the things we're going to be really going through today is, you know, is Halloween the tradition of going door to door, something that people think is COVID safe? Obviously, we're here on October 1st. We still have 30 days until Halloween, 30 days being a lifetime in 2020. So some of the predictions that we make today um, may not hold true. We could, um, and obviously knock on wood, have a second major wave in the U.S., which would make going out for Halloween a non-starter. Maybe some of the municipalities and cities get their arms around it and people can have some type of normalcy for Halloween. So that remains to be seen. So some of what we're gonna be talking about today is really just based upon the state of things as of this very moment, but obviously knowing that things could change. Um, LA County walked back ho their Halloween ban, um, and but they're still saying that trick-or-treating is not recommended. So at first they flat out banned it, and now they're saying you can do it, but we don't really recommend it. Uh, we'll see, you know, how well the, you know, the, the citizens in LA County sort of adhere to that recommendation. Um, as we mentioned, Halloween is so very significant. Chocolate brands are start planning two years in advance, given how much volume it is for their companies. Um, Hershey's doing a lot of really interesting things uh, to prepare for Halloween amidst COVID-19. Um, they're leaning into an earlier start to the season and also sort of addressing geographic differences. Uh, Crystal, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, they're working, I think, with the Costume Association to have a map up of like, you know, the safer areas for, you know, Halloween activities and things like that. They've kind of leaned more into uh, at-home consumption packaging. So that's like packaging, um, you know, in bulk that you would eat at the house instead of things that you would plan on passing off to trick-or-treaters in hopes of kind of increasing that portion of sales. Um, and you know, they are, they did do a little bit of an earlier start to the retail season. And that seems to have helped based on some of the, you know, 
results that I've seen there. People are right. more likely to grab it. And so hopefully that will increase sales. So if there is a dip in trick or treating, it, you know, will account for some of that. Yeah, absolutely. 46% uh, of the people have already made Halloween plans this year. So it is that one of those kind of temples of the year, especially in the fall where consumers are planning in advance. Um, kids are already starting to think about what they're going to wear. So it, it's something that is a, it seems Halloween seems like a hallmark holiday, so to speak, but it's important. It's important. It's a rite of passage for kids' upbringings. It definitely um, bonds community connections, I believe. Um, and again, it's critically important to so many different industries, not the least of which is the candy industry. So today we're going to be exploring changes um, in really three areas. First and foremost, Halloween preparation. Uh, secondly, Halloween spending. And third, the actual night of Halloween in terms of how things are going to change. Uh, and first, we're going to go into our section Halloween preparation. And before we dive in, those of you who are um, longtime viewers of our State of the Consumer webinar um, know that we have a section called Ask America, where we will ask you to vote on one question for each section you want to see our on-demand consumer panel answer. And at the end of this webinar, we will see the answers to those questions. So the first question for our S America segment um, is one of the following four that you can vote from. One, what are you most excited for this Halloween? Two, are you adding any new traditions to Halloween this year? Three, what is the most creative thing you've seen for Halloween 2020? And four, what are you most nervous about for Halloween? So you can go ahead and sort of select what question you want to have or Susie's on-demand panel answer. And at the end of this webinar, we will find out the answers to those questions. So moving on um, to our first section. Uh, this is a quote uh, from Christopher uh, Ginslisberger of the National Confectioners Association. He said, Halloween may have to be at a distance or at home, but that doesn't mean Halloween is not happening. Um, so that, you know, the way I interpret that is that it's not, people are gonna, recognize Halloween. And although they may not be able to celebrate in ways in the past, they're going to find new and unique ways to se uh, celebrate this. Is that sort of what you're seeing happen, Crystal? Yeah. So uh, I think within the last week or so, the CDC did classify trick-or-treating and trunk-or-treating as higher risk. Um, but they also released a list of low risk activities, such as celebrating at home, doing a virtual costume party. Uh, I have four young nieces and nephews. Their mom is planning to do a scavenger hunt at the house. Um, and it does make me really sad to not be able to celebrate Halloween with this, them this year because I typically go and go trick or treating with them and things like that. Um, but, you know, it's just, it's not, we, she didn't feel the safe. And we're in Northern Illinois, we're having a bit of an outbreak here. Um, and so, yeah, she's already kind of planning and ordering candy for her kids so that they'll have different types of products and things like that to do for the scavenger hunt. So that's a big one. Um, I think, uh, or orchards and pumpkin patches were rated as moderate risk. Um, but I know a lot of people are looking at that as well. Um, par costume parades, um, so they don't have to go door to door and things like that. So, and I'm excited to see all the new ways that people are coming up with to celebrate. Yep. Pa you know, at the same time, parents are saying Halloween's more important than ever this year. Obviously, you know, so many parents are struggling with their kids being homeschooled, um, you know, with remote learning, uh, not being around their friends as much, not having so many of those rite of passage, whether it's Fourth of July fireworks or going to summer camp or so many things they've missed. And so many were hoping that finally, now, October will be a time where the kids would be able to get back to some sense of normalcy, which is why, you know, three quarters of parents said it's, it, it, it has taken on an increased level of importance. Uh, about 50% of non-parents are also making plans in advance this year for Halloween, so it's not just for the kids. Um, you know, there's a lot of young single people that look at it as a very social event. Uh, as well. Uh, Ferrero, um, you know, one of the leading candy companies, uh, has launched a really interesting campaign called 31 Days of Halloween, um, where they basically are almost extending the life cycle of Halloween to kind of focus on different ideas. Uh, Chris, I don't know if, what do you think about companies, you know, taking Halloween and extending it? Has that been an effective way to drive more awareness for, for confectionery products? Yeah, I think in the past, consumers used to be a little bit skeptical about things like that, but time is completely meaningless in 2020, and right. everyone just wants some joy in their lives. So I think it's going to be received really well. Um, I think today, Mars released their app to allow for like virtual trick-or-treating and to like decorate virtual haunted houses that you can share with your friends. Uh, so that'll be a month-long thing as well, I think. Um, and like I said, they had the candy in the stores a little bit earlier this year for some of the supermarkets and some of the brands. So I think it's going to be a good thing. And I don't 
think people as adults always realize exactly what you were saying, that it has been really stressful for kids uh, to be home in remote learning. We talk a lot about how that's stressful for the parents, but the kids are going through a lot. And so I understand why people want to celebrate this year and why that's really important. Um, and so I'm glad that candy companies are coming through with unique opportunities and ways for them to still feel like they can experience the holiday in safe ways. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, nearly half of people are planning on looking up fun and creative ways to prepare, uh, to your point. Um, this is a really interesting concept. Um, you know, 45 plus fun trick or treat ideas for the spookiest car ever. So, you know, you're, you're basically seeing brands try to come up with different ways to make people kind of tap into their creative brains. One thing we've seen and we've talked about um, on past state of the consumer webinars is this whole DIY craze that's happening where to your point, consumers are home, they have so much more time and you see companies like Michael's having over 300% year over year growth in e-commerce sales uh, because people have more time, parents are looking for ways to entertain their kids. So anything in the DIY space as it relates to Halloween and costumes, even if you're just showcasing your costume over Zoom, I think it's a great way for brands to kind of drive engagement with consumers and tap into a trend that we've seen really uh, burgeoning throughout this COVID crisis. Um, social media obviously has been and will continue to be a constant source of, ins of Halloween inspiration. Probably now more than ever, we've seen the use of streaming platforms and, and video platforms like TikTok and YouTube really explode. This is really the first year that TikTok is a mainstream phenomenon during Halloween. I uh, wouldn't expect to see nothing less than tons of crazy uh, videos on TikTok now that we obviously thankfully still have it here in the U.S. for, for um, the Halloween season. So uh, I would imagine, you know, to see social media still play a role that's front and center. Uh, and, and, and Instagram being obviously another main hub uh, of interest and inspiration uh, for costumes. Um, this is a really cute concept that Butterfinger came up with the Butterfinger investi investigators. Really, it's a content series based around people stealing each other's candy. Uh, my kids steal have for the last five years stolen each other's Halloween candy. They each try to hide it in the rooms and people take it. So I think it's an opportunity for brands uh, that are driving deeper engagement to understand that, yes, there are challenges right now with retail, but the demand is there. And consumers love brands like Butterfinger and Tootsie Roll. And I'm seeing on the comments right now, all the great brands, Catherine loves High Chew and Laura loves Nerds and Kenny loves Candy Corn. So we're seeing the audience right now, um, Charisse loves Snickers, all talking about their favorite candies. These are tried and true brands. And they're brands that consumers have a lot of heart and emotion for. So I think brands um, in a world where consumers are streaming and staring at their phones so much more, can really take advantage of this by creating content that's compelling um, and deeply engaging with consumers. Um, nearly 60% of people still plan to make Halloween themed food or drinks this year. Another major trend we've seen happen during the COVID crisis is we've seen the reversal of a 60 year trend where, um, you know, 60 years ago, way more food was consumed in home versus out of home. And then slowly over a 60 year period, more and more food was, food was consumed outside the home at restaurants and, and you know, um, at, at bars and places like that. And it finally got to a point where it was even uh, right before the pandemic. And now we're seeing the trend reverse, obviously, because there's not a lot of restaurants that are open right now that consumers are going to. So more food is being consumed at home and it creates a huge opportunity for food and beverage companies to really market themselves as ingredient brands. And I think, you know, whether you make macaroni and cheese or you make pasta or whatever it may be that you're distributing to consumers, this is a, this is a great opportunity for food brands to put themselves front and center, um, you know, in the, as consumers try to make their own Halloween theme food or drinks um, yeah. over six Sorry, on, I yeah. into that a little bit. Um, I think it's a great opportunity for the candy industry as well because a lot of their products are baking products or can be used as baking products. Um, everything, you know, people I think often think of like Hershey Kisses and things like that, but people make, you know, little Sour Patch candies in the oven and stuff like that as well. And so it's also been, you know, it's been really great for the confectionery industry as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and, and the reason I bring up just the broader, whether it's Rice crispy Treats or whatever it may, is it, you know, I think the food and beverage companies have seen a boom this year, and this could be something where they could even take advantage of further, you know, as consumers, not just trick or treat, but also, you know, turn it into an event to make things at home. That's a great point. Uh, over 60% of people still plan to decorate their home this year. Again, going back to that DIY trend, uh, the home has become so much more of an important part 
of consumers' lives because they're not going to work anymore. Um, it's become their restaurant, it's become their office, it's become their kid's school. And that's why you're seeing companies' stocks like Home Depot and Lowe's and Wayfair explode because people are investing more in the home. And I think this is really just an extension of that. We did um, a, a State of the Consumer webinar a couple of weeks ago with Domino Magazine, uh, which you can actually look up on our YouTube page and see where we talk about the trends of the home and how spending in the home is only gonna grow over time. I think this is just an extension of that. Over 60% of people plan to watch a Halloween theme movie, uh, which they deem most important this year. What's your favorite Halloween theme movie, Crystal? Uh, Hocus Pocus, I'm pretty uh, basic, I think. Like, That's cool. He likes scary movies, so he watches He like watches them all fall, but uh, I, I get too scared. So. Yeah, yeah, I'm not a big horror movie fan myself. So uh, we're going to go into our second section now, Halloween spending. And before we go into that, we'll go into our Ask America segment, uh, where, again, you, the audience, can tell us what question you want Susie's on-demand panel to answer. Today, the four questions uh, on this particular topic are, one, what have you bought more for Halloween this year? Two, what have you bought less of for Halloween this year? Three, how concerned are you about prices for Halloween costumes and candy and the like? And four, what brands are you most likely to spend on for Halloween? So you can choose what answer you'd like to see our panel uh, answer, and we will go to the Halloween spending section. So last year, Americans spent more than $8 billion on Halloween, $4.5 billion on candy alone. Uh, how does this fare with prior years, Crystal? Uh, I think that's pretty typical, um, maybe up or down just a little bit, but it's going to be really interesting to see how things go this year. Um, yeah. Historically, candy has been relatively recession proof uh, because it's a relatively inexpensive thing that you can get. Yeah. They'll feel like you're experiencing like a luxury or a moment yeah. of joy. Uh, but I mean, we haven't really had a test run on pandemic proof. So none of us have. No. So seeing how Halloween goes, but also I'm really interested to see how the winter holidays go. All we really have to look to is the Easter sales, uh, which I think took a small hit. Uh, and it really helped candy companies realize that they needed to make sure they had things in place for the Halloween season this year. Yeah. So and I, Easter, like I mean, Easter was a time where the uncertainty, we were in the heart of the pandemic. We People were worried about supply chain issues there. Nobody was leaving their home. Uh, you know, the news was so scary. We're, it's still scary, but we're at a point where I think we're close enough along from a medical and scientific standpoint, and things are slowly starting to open. Some of this is then closed again, but I think, you know, Halloween is in a much better place uh, for the consumer than, than Easter was. So, you know, you have to hope that we're going to see better results here for sure. Uh, half of people will be surprised if they get trick-or-treaters this year. That's interesting. You know, it's normally you would know that Halloween, you're going to have kids knocking on your door. Many consumers now don't know if they're going to come or not. And, uh, you know, they'll probably sadly be more houses that will be with the lights off and shut down. And, you know, maybe some people will just leave candy outside on their doorstep, depending upon where they live. But there's it just goes along with the uncertainty to all things good we've seen this year. Uh, today, the NFL announced they're canceling Pittsburgh Steelers game this weekend. So things that we always thought would happen on Sunday or on Halloween, not so much in 2020. Yeah, I think it's going to be really regional as well. Like the Midwest is kind of bracing for autumn as people move inside, which tends to spread it more. Um, but I think, you know, the South seems to be doing better than it was. So it's going to be interesting. But I think whether people trick or treat will probably depend really specifically on how things are going at the time of the holiday, which you know, is still a month away, like you said. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, this is a campaign that Snickers and M&M did, uh, more tricks, more treats, more neighborhoods than before, a virtual trick or treat experience coming this October. So, you know, they are taking the concept of Halloween and making it virtual, uh, which is something that I think you're going to start to see a lot of companies do in a world where there's zoom weddings and zoom birthday parties. How much are you hearing about these sort of virtual trick or treating activations? Yeah, I'm really, uh, I, I guess, impressed that Mars was able to roll this out so quickly. My understanding is they were working on it before um, and then decided to kind of push it forward this year because of everything going on. And I 
think they're going to kind of look to it to see if they want to expand these types of programs. And other candy companies will probably be watching how this goes as well to see how successful it is. But yeah, you can send real credits for real candy that you can get online or at local stores to people and still feel like you're having that kind of experience and experiencing the holiday. So I, yeah. you know, I'm hopeful that it goes really well. Absolutely. Absolutely. 80% of people will be buying the same amount of candy this year, if not more, which, you know, that's obviously a sign of hope for, for these companies, despite the uncertainty with trick or treating, despite the sort of channel based challenges that the candy industry has, people are planning on, on consuming candy. And I think that's great for an industry that like so many others are in need of a kind of good break uh, there. Yeah, there's so much, um, like you said, emotion attached to candy and eating candy. And people are really seeking that out right now. And Halloween is a time when our comfort brands really shine and where people have a lot of memories associated with these brands. So I think, you know, even if people aren't sure if they're going to get trick or treaters or they don't think they will, they're still going to feel like they want to reach for that bag of Snickers that they get at yeah. and things like that. Um, or give their kids the joy of having their, you know, their pump, hollow pumpkin filled up with candy. It's like, you don't want to, your, your kids are only five or six or seven years old once. Right. And you don't want them to lose that year and that experience. Yeah. And some candy companies, I think American licorice is working with other brands and like competitors even to do a Halloween box. So you can order it and you get a bunch of different brands like you would if you were trick or treating. And so things like that are, um, really innovative and you know i think it's really great that they've come up with stuff like that yeah absolutely um this is from rob dickerson an analyst from jeffrey's self-consumption has always been a massive part of the holiday it may end up salvaging sales for candy makers this year halloween is in a single day for the industry rather a 10-week treat buying fest the holiday is based on an excuse to buy candy and obviously again we talk about the pandemic and the pandemic has really driven um increased demand in comfort foods so that coupled with what Rob's talking about, again, could be something that's kind of counterbalancing maybe some of the limitations consumers have actually on Halloween night. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, like I said, Hershey says typically half their Halloween sales are self-consumption basically, or at-home consumption. So I think that number is gonna go up this year and uh, for all the candy companies, and it is going to be the thing that uh, the industry is kind of counting on to get through this holiday. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, no surprise, candy sales are up 13% versus last year over the last four weeks. Again, that really is pandemic related. Uh, nearly three quarters of consumers are spending on Halloween themed foods and drinks. So, um, and, and over half are willing to spend more in a Halloween costume this year than last. So we are seeing, and it's happening in so many different industries, consumers spend more. Uh, the savings rate amongst US consumers uh, is at a 10 year high. Reason being that consumers are not able to eat and drink and travel, uh, or they're not spending money on luxury goods. So consumers, despite definitely macroeconomic challenges that we're seeing, and despite the fact that some consumers are really struggling, we are seeing consumers step up and spend in certain areas. Um, and that's why you know over half of people are willing to spend more in their Halloween costumes this year, even if not as many people are going to see it. You know they're going to have more time to be able to um, come up with something elaborate um, and maybe look at it as a, again a DIY related activity. Uh, uh, master, uh, yeah, go on, please. Sorry, I was just going to add with social media and stuff. I think people kind of see it as more people seeing it than they would have. I mean, even yeah, like no, great point. And things like that. And it's actually, a, I mean, for candy specifically, you know, making products that look good in Instagram photos has been really important. And it's why people buy, you know, if you buy a piece of candy that's like rainbow colored or in a cool packaging and design and people want to post that, people will have been shown to buy products specifically just to post a photo on social media of it. So yeah. that's an area that can help the candy industry as well too. Yeah, I mean, we've seen restaurants come up with elaborate Sundays and they'll charge three times or four times the amount and they'll be able to sell them because they know that you know younger consumers are going to take a picture of it post on Instagram and almost make the food a status symbol. So I think Halloween costumes are really no different. Um, masks are obviously a huge part of the overall equation this year, um, not masks in a traditional sense. Although in some instances, people's costumes may have masks that may you know replace the masks that we're seeing people running around in um, by the hundreds of millions in the US right now. 
but um, you know, it really creates a whole nother opportunity, I think, for companies that uh, make costumes and even companies in the candy industry to really play into obviously a whole new space this year uh, because people will be wearing masks obviously when they're trick or treating and they'll probably be something that will be in addition to their uh, costume that they're gonna be wearing. Um, over 50% of adults plan on buying elaborate costumes this year. So again, goes with time. Like elaborate means time consuming. Consumers have more time now, so maybe this is the year to do something really elaborate. And to your point, social media makes it worthwhile for them to do so. Um, the DIY craze, you know, the more um, available discretionary expenditures, all those things combined, meaning that we may have some pretty incredible mass uh, in 2020. Um, and really, you know, CPGs and retailers really can play into the space. So I thought this was a cute thing. Dunkin' Donuts has licensed, um, you know, costumes uh, that people can dress up in. So no matter what your brand is, whether what category you play in, this is an opportunity for you to kind of enter into the Halloween realm by having your, your brand be part of a Halloween costume um, exploratory for consumers. Um, over half of parents uh, will be more elaborate with their kids' costumes as well. So dressing their kids up, making their kid almost their own personal canvas to have fun uh, with the costumes as well. So that's about preparation. And now we're going to go into Halloween night and what's going to happen during Halloween night. And for our last section of Ask America questions, um, you can ask our panel one of these four questions. One, what brands do you think have done a good job at creating health and safety focused Halloween plans? Two, how concerned are you about contracting COVID-19 on Halloween night? Three, what brands do you think have done a good job making Halloween 2020 more exciting? And for other than safety, what do you want to see more from brands for on Halloween? So pick the question um, that you want to see our panel answer. And we will dive into our last section of today's webinar, which is about Halloween night. And uh, we will have time, obviously, for questions at the end. So uh, you'll probably see Abel um, on our chat um, kind of asking you and, and feel free to submit any questions you want uh, for either myself or Crystal that we'll get to at the end of today's webinar. So nearly half of people feel their towns given ample guidance on protocols for Halloween 2020. Um, I do not envy being somebody um, in local or um, state-bound government right now. It's not easy to give um, citizens the right level of direction with so much change, much of which being out of their control. Uh, but you know, it's, you know, the, the local municipalities know that they need to give consumers, um, you know, direction on what to do. And again, I think in, in many markets, you can expect this to change several times in the next 30 days, 30 days being a lifetime uh, in the COVID era. Over 80% of people plan to celebrate from home this year, up from only 17% last year. So more and more people are staying home. Um, they want to celebrate at home. They may be having small gatherings, but that just shows you how we probably will have um, a significant uh, downturn in the amount of trick-or-treaters. Um, thankfully, what we're seeing through this research is still it may not impact the candy industry, but it will impact the way that consumers celebrate Halloween night. Uh, over half of consumers are willing to have a socially distant Halloween party with others. We saw during our last webinar about the, the future of the home that many consumers are saying that they're hosting more now than they ever have, uh, albeit smaller gatherings. But, you know, the reason why is they can't meet up with their friends at a restaurant or bar. Uh, you know, they can't meet up with their friends in the office. So, you know, they're left to their own devices in their own home to host people. And that's why they're doing it more. And we're seeing that, obviously, it seems like play out uh, during Halloween. Um, drive throughs have been huge um, here in New York. There's several uh, drive throughs that are happening in the tri-state area because it, it's just it's a socially distant activity that gets people out. Um, we've seen through prior research um, that since the pandemic that consumers miss movie theaters. They miss going out and having a drive through as part of a Halloween experience, I think is a great idea. And in terms of trends and, um, you know, we're, we're being asked like to talk about trends today, dr drive through and drive in movies are definitely something that we're seeing more of. And I think this is a place for auto companies to play in, obviously candy companies to play in, um, where you either can do a drive-in movie for a Halloween themed movie, or what we're seeing here is actually a drive-through experience where you take your family and you're kind of driving through something like that. So uh, have you ever been to something like that, Crystal? 
I know it sounds like you're not a big fan of horror, horror <laughs> flicks. No, I mean, I've been to uh, drive-in movies back when I was a kid, back when they were a lot more popular, I think. So, I mean, yeah, yeah you could sell candy at those events. Obviously, people might, if they're watching an actual movie, they might want to bring candy with them and that kind of thing. But the drive through Haunted House is really innovative. I actually hadn't really heard much about that, but I know haunted houses were rate, like indoor haunted houses were rated higher risk by the CDC. So yeah. seeing uh, people kind of think on their feet and come up with new ideas and things like that. I mean, there's drive through Christmas lights typically in my area. Exactly, that's what I was thinking of, right. Yeah, kind of fun. How, how big are, we talk about movie theaters, how big of a channel is that for candy companies? I would imagine it has to be significant. Yeah, it's significant. I don't have any numbers off the top of my head, but right. it's significant. And it also has typically a pretty high profit margin on the products that they yeah. sell. And once you get, you know, one product in a chain, that can be really effective for sales as well. So I think, you know, candy companies have kind of been trying to tap into like eat candy while you watch a movie at home and things like that yeah. um, to kind of give consumers that, you know, selling the theater boxes at the grocery store and things like that more. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we haven't had theaters since like March, right? I mean, I in a long way. yeah, so that's, and that's an industry where, you know, with, with Netflix and the proliferation of companies like Sonos that make it so easy to have a home theater, you know, what's going to be of movie theaters. Cause I would imagine that has a big impact on the candy industry. I happen to believe that companies like Hulu and Netflix and Microsoft are actually going to buy the movie theater chains so they can actually have an, ex uh, you know, experiential element to their digital streaming platforms. Um, so people can kind of touch and feel their brand. We've seen companies like Apple really take advantage of that in the tech space. So that's a prediction I think is going to come out of this. I think, these companies are going to be really hard bent to stay alive without some type of outside company to come in. Uh, but we'll see. And if that happens, that, then that could, you know, equally help the candy industry for sure. Yeah, for sure. I think that, um, you know, offering movies on like premiere night has sort of happened throughout the pandemic where you can pay 20 yeah. to $40. So I'm really interested to see if that trend continues, like if that worked for them or how that works. I'm a huge MCU fan. So I've been really disappointed that Black Widow was delayed all year and we don't know when that's going to come out. But I know like Disney decided they didn't want to release it on demand. So, I mean, I think that shows some hope for the theater experience going forward. Absolutely. Uh, nearly half the people are considering Zoom parties for Halloween. Uh, so obviously, you talk about people wanting to showcase their costumes, you know, via social media. Well, Zoom, which was not a household brand name last year, certainly is this year. And I think, you know, it's another way for kids to showcase what they're doing. And um, I've hear, heard of some families doing costume contests over Zoom um, and things like that. So I think that's a that's a big trend. We actually just got a question um, from Lucas that we can get to, I think, during the Q&A and maybe it's time to just put in your head, Crystal, which is like, our Consumers are going to stop eating candy in efforts to stay healthy. What, how big are the headwinds in that area and what are the candy companies doing? So thanks for asking that, Lucas, it's something that we can actually definitely get to. Um, and you see retailers, like going back to my point, uh, retailers like Party City are, are pushing out content, how to throw a Halloween Zoom party. I think content right now is king for brands. It's the way that they're engaging. Consumers are in need of direction, so many different areas of their lives. So to see a retailer like Party City come in and actually show consumers how to throw a Halloween Zoom party, obviously with the help of their decorations that they sell at Party City is a great way for, you know, brands to stay front and center right now. Um, so Halloween goers most uh, and first and foremost are looking for brands to give them advice on how to stay safe. We've seen through our research over and over again that consumers right now are trusting brands more than they are the government in so many different topics. Um, and it, it's opportunity for brands that build trust, put their products front and center and really help consumers. What are your thoughts on this issue, Crystal? Yeah, I um, I think it's been a really great opportunity, like you said, for brands to build trust with consumers and to continue that like good emotional feeling people have associated with candy to see like brands take this seriously and take their health and safety seriously. And that's been really good. Um, and there's just, there's been so many innovations coming out. Um, like we've mentioned the, the Mars app and the Halloween boxes and all sorts of things like that. Yeah. So I think, um, I think it's been really good and I'm proud of the brands for stepping up for that. Absolutely. 
Um, this is an activation by Hershey's where basically, you know, it's like hover over a county and display the COVID risk. Depending upon your color code, we have, uh, you know, um, we have loads of tricks in our bag of treats. Basically, it's a map and a guide that Hershey's giving to consumers through the lens of sort of Halloween uh, creative that allows them. So I think it's a great it's a great thing for Hershey's to be able to do. Um, you know, obviously Hershey's wants consumer everybody to be trick or treating, but they also are showing here that they want their consumers to be safe. Uh, and I think this is a great way to do this and doing it in a way where kids can actually understand how safe it is, et cetera. Um, so what, is this sort of what you're talking about, Crystal? And what do you think about an activation like this? Yeah, I mean, so everything about this whole pandemic has been so unpredictable. So I'm glad that brands weren't uh, kind of approaching this thinking it would all be over by Halloween and they didn't need to plan for it because these projects take, you know, they're a huge undertaking. And for sure. them to say like, you know what, we're going to plan as though this is still going to be an issue in October and kind of work from that perspective. I think that ended up being the right perspective, even though a lot of us didn't really know what was going to happen in October all the way, you know, when they started planning these things back in the spring, it was, it was just a lot going on. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because if you think about it, the candy industry has been so predictable and somewhat cyclical for so long. It's we sell our candy in movie theaters. We, Halloween is big for us. We know who our big retailers are: Walmart, Target, etc. There hasn't wasn't hasn't been that much disruption. And now with COVID, with the e-commerce adoption for groceries, with things we're talking about for Halloween, all of a sudden you see these companies that have had tried and true business models really have to be on their toes and make decisions like they've never had to make before. Yeah, I always say that uh, grocery has kind of gotten a long head start for e-commerce because people did not adopt it quickly, but we all knew it yep. was coming. We just didn't know when it was going to hit. And now it's here. <laughs> yeah, and it came now. And so companies have been planning for it for a while, com coming up with innovations and things like that, you know, yep. for like click and collect where you pick up at store. You're seeing them do things like putting candy by the lockers where you might collect your items um, and offering candy um, at the end of like your checkout process online and things like that. But yeah, they've had to, uh, like you said, it's here now. So sure is. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, this is another Halloween's ha happening, Halloween Central. This is just another brand, you know, again, it's very much along the lines of helping consumers navigate this and understand you know where, what's safe what's not what you should actually be doing so um that's what we have today and we're going to bring in abel now hey abel hey what are you going to be what are you going to be for halloween this year what am i going to be for halloween um i don't know i i haven't even thought of halloween which maybe is kind of sad because yearly it's like such a big holiday um especially I, so within the gay community halloween's like a massive halloween uh, holiday it's almost as big as like fourth of july for everyone else and I have to say this year, there's been no discussion about it. No one's talking about it. And it's kind of sad because um, it's normally such a big holiday for us. Um, yeah. So I'm not, you gotta I'm not get sure. on that. Yeah, I better get on that. So that'll be my next uh, big project after this webinar. But um, so yeah, sure. we've in the background, we've been running kind of the questions that you all um, have asked us, uh, you know, through that poll and I'm excited to share the results with you. So um, kind of while you guys were doing this webinar, I just went onto the Suzy platform and I fielded the questions uh, and what's cool is that, Susie, we have our own kind of proprietary audience and panel who's answering them. So, um, you know, we can get up to 500 responses in 20 to 30 minutes, which is pretty incredible. So um, the first question that we have here is, um, are you concerned with contracting COVID-19 on Halloween night? Uh, and what's interesting, 23% of people said they're pretty neutral on it, uh, but uh, an overwhelming about 45% of people, um, they're pretty concerned uh, <laughs> might catch COVID during this time. So. Um, you know, people are concerned about the greater proximity of people and, and seeing, um, you know, all the increased kind of touching of candies. So it's pretty interesting there. Um, here, are they, are you adding any new traditions to Halloween this year? Um, I think here we saw a lot more people are doing things with their families. So you start to see home, um, virtual, movie, um, you know, decorating, baking, things that you would traditionally do by yourself. Um, and what's interesting, I kind of went through some of the results and pulled out some of my, my favorites here. But you see a lot of people who are just generally pretty scared. So I'm not leaving candy outside for kids to help themselves. So uh, I'm not exposed. Um, I'm probably just gonna watch a spooky movie, uh, watching with my family. Um, I'm gonna fill a, 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 a plastic pumpkin with treats and then do kind of something scavenger hunt with my kids. Um, someone said, I don't know yet, but the whole idea of Zoom parties kind of sounds interesting. 
uh, might be a cool way to celebrate uh, near people who don't live near me, um, which I didn't even think of. Like Halloween's such a traditionally yeah. thing. You go down the street, you see the kids from the block. Um, but this might be a way that you actually broaden that experience with maybe your cousin who lives halfway across the country, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, and then finally, uh, which brands are you most likely to spend on for Halloween? So no shocker here. We're seeing the big candy, candy, um, you know, people here. So you see Hershey, Snicker, chocolate, uh, Mars, Reese's, Oreo. Um, and then you kind of see places that people are going to be shopping. So Amazon, um, which again, you see that rise in e-commerce, especially when it comes to candy, uh, Walmart and Target. So um, interesting kind of what, what we see there. Great. Thanks, Abel. Um, yeah. Should we have some questions? Yeah, definitely. So um, one of the things that people really want to know about is obviously during this holiday and some of the other holidays this year, we start to see new trends of how people are really celebrating. Um, so um, Matt, maybe this is a question for you, but what trends do you expect to kind of continue as we start to hit the peak December holidays? Yeah, I mean, I think that this is the start of, you know, in, in our at our company, Abel, as you know, it's in the fourth quarter and the fourth quarter is our biggest time of year at Suzy, I think it's the biggest time of year for so many different businesses. And Halloween is almost like the kickoff because then you have obviously Thanksgiving and then very quickly thereafter, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and then you have the, the heart of the holiday season um, and Christmas into New Year's. And I think this is where so many businesses are made or broken each year. And I think one of the biggest trends we're gonna see overall is just, I think e-commerce is going to explode in a way that no one realizes um, over the fourth quarter of this year. If you think about it, consumers usually spend money on a, ones who can afford it, obviously, and not everybody can, but they're some type of vacation, right? They're going away. This year, a lot of consumers will not be able to, right? So they have more, and as we talked earlier, they're going to have more discretionary expenditures. They will not be rushing into stores like Walmart and Target and waiting in line and Black Friday, we're going to Best Buy for that cheap TV and fighting over it like we see every single year. They will, but for a fraction of, uh, you know, of what we've seen in the past. And where that shift is all gonna be headed to is people on e-commerce and people buying stuff online. And they're gonna be buying stuff that entertains them, that makes their homes better places, and that allows them to give back to their friends and family members. So you're gonna see a tremendous rise in apparel, um, in home furnishing and, and home goods, um, in electronics. And I think that's the major trend we're gonna see. Where does candy play a role in all that? I mean, I think we're gonna have to see what happens, but we do see this underlying demand for comfort foods as well as for alcohol. I mean, what we've seen in the beer, liquor and spirit space is that, you know, their on-premise business has gone down to almost zero, right? They're not selling stuff in bars or restaurants or nightclubs, but at the same time, there's such an increased demand for people to drink at home and to order online with platforms like Drizzly, it's almost counteracted it. So I think that really bodes well for the candy industry because as Crystal's talked about, um, especially products like chocolate are always in demand in times of consumer distress. So that's a high level, but I just think e-commerce is really still being underestimated by so many different businesses. Definitely. And I'm actually kind of curious from you, Crystal, from your perspective, typically what does um, you know the winter holiday really mean for the confectionery industry? Like how, how big is it for them? Um, and what kind of things do you see carry over from Halloween onto that winter holiday? Yeah, it's a it's a big holiday. I think I looked this morning and it was also over $4 billion in sales for the winter holidays. So I know people kind of associate candy more with things like Halloween, but a lot of people buy candy for the winter holidays. A lot of that is bought to share at parties that aren't probably going to be happening. So it's gonna be interesting to see how that affects things. But I think when you were talking about e-commerce, people are buying things online and they're gonna be sending gifts to people that they would normally see in person. So they're also gonna be doing that with you know gourmet candies and things like that. Um, so that's a real opportunity for a lot of the, maybe the smaller companies, but also the major companies to have gifts available that people can send easily to people that they're not able to see this year and that kind of thing. Definitely. Um, so I kind of bring this question up that Matt alluded to earlier, but obviously during the pandemic, people are not um, exercising as much. Gyms have closed. So what are your thoughts on people stopping eating candy and in efforts to stay healthy? Um, so maybe Chris, I'll hit you there first. Yeah, I, there's a lot of research on this kind of pre-pandemic that I've seen. 
And uh, the thing is, people in surveys say that they're going to stop eating candy to eat healthy, but then they don't actually do it when they go to the store and spend money on things. Or they might buy a healthy product one time, but then go right back to the unhealthy version later. Sugar-free uh, is something the industry has been working on for a while. And aside from gum, it's been kind of difficult to really break into that for the confectionery industry. So I don't think, I mean, there's a lot of trend data saying that people are kind of looking for healthier products and things like that as they are more aware of health in general. But whether that translates to actual changes in sales, we'll see. A lot of companies are coming out with like natural colors, organic, and those tend to do pretty well as long as they still taste just as good as the original products. Cause and you're also saying things like changes in serving sizes or like you have like the Oreo thins. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we see it happen in the soda industry where you'll see many cans of soda like they have in Europe really taking off here. So I think there are other things that these companies can do to reduce the caloric intake. Um, but still have it as a sort of a responsible snack. And I think that's something that you yeah. could expect to see as well. A lot of confectionery companies have pledged to reduce their calories per serving size and things like that. And they've come out with smaller packaging as well along those lines. Um, I think they have like 100 calorie Snickers now that they have at a lot of checkouts and stuff like that. So people would rather eat 100 calorie Snickers than a sugar-free full-size Snickers typically. So, yeah. Definitely. Um, kind of an interesting question here. So obviously we talk about the rise of e-com. So companies like Amazon, Walmart, um, people are asking a little bit about local delivery companies. So Postmates, um, something called GoPuff. Um, how, yeah. how do you anticipate something like that impacting candy sales? Are you seeing consumers starting to use those um, as avenues? Um, and do you think there's a big potential upside opportunity there as well for candy industry? Uh, do you want me to take this? Yeah, go for it, please, yeah. Yeah. So I think it is a huge opportunity for like small chocolate shops and things like that. A lot of them have taken uh, longer to get set up online. A lot of them had to get a crash course in getting set up for online sales as a result of the pandemic very quickly back in the spring. Um, but those places can make it a lot easier for them to be in that segment. You know, you can order from bakeries and so gourmet chocolate shops and things like that. Also, there's an opportunity there as well. Yeah, you might remember like back in the day, probably before your time, Abel, maybe even before your time too, Crystal, there's a company called uh, Cosmo and Cosmo was an instant delivery service where they would deliver stuff mostly in dorm rooms where you can get, you know, they would deliver, you know, a bar of chocolate and a, and a can of ginger ale to you. And GoPuff is trying to do that and almost bring that back right now. And it, it really was taking off last year on college campuses. And I think that company and, and distribution strategies like that, as well as platforms like Instacart, are just incredibly important to the candy industry. If I am uh, a leading candy company, I am looking on how I can partner with Instacart in the way that they merchandise to try to get my stuff thrown in. Because it doesn't, if somebody's food shopping for you, it doesn't matter what's at the checkout aisle, right? And I think if there's innovative ways to partner with those companies, it could be a, a you know a huge way to kind of um, you know shift into the maybe downward trends that you might see with, with the grocery channel. Definitely, um, Crystal. Maybe a question for you, but with all these different alternatives for trigger treating kind of starting to surface up, what have been what has been probably the most innovative uh, thing that you've seen when it comes to the actual trick or treat experience? I mean, I think I feel like we kind of touched on some of them during the presentation. I, I'm really excited about the Mars virtual trick or treating app because you can send things to people um, and things like that. And the Halloween boxes, I've seen a few companies come out with those so people can order them for the house and get the candy experience of trick or treating. Um, I'm seeing a lot of people online, you know, talking about the scavenger hunts at home and things like that. So um, I'm excited and I'm hopeful that uh, candy sales will be a big part of the celebrations, no matter how people kind of decide to approach that. Definitely. Um, what's kind of interesting here is obviously a lot of these new trends like virtual um, Zoom parties are something that have become a mainstay right now. So you know, it, let's let's think of maybe a year, a year and a half later, we're in a completely COVID free world, um, you know, 2021 Halloween, which of these traditions that are maybe starting this year, do you think will continue on to next year? 
I mean, I think the virtual parties might have a place going forward. Um, I think people are going to be really anxious to go back to some of these traditions, you know, like typical trick or treating and things like that and being outside with the public. But uh, something like the Mars app, you know, like I said, I think that was in development before the pandemic. So that's something that definitely has staying power after the pandemic. Um, and it's, you know, all about connecting people, connecting people across the country, connecting with family and that kind of thing. So I think those things will linger. I think the e-commerce stuff is all going to linger now that people have cha basically changed their habits um, for how they're buying stuff. So, you know, I guess we'll see what happens. But Agreed. Definitely. Um, well, that's really all the questions that I have for both of you, but um, thank you guys so much. Yeah, Abel, thanks so much for doing this. And Crystal, obviously you have such a wealth of expertise um, you know, in the candy industry, and I'm sure our audience got a lot of value. Uh, we've been asked several times, will the recording be available? Um, somebody, Robin just said, will the recording be available? I need my baker brother to listen. Robin, yes, the recording will be available. Uh, we will be sending out um, a copy of the deck as well as recording to all attendees for you to share with your colleagues. Um, we will be having several more state of consumers webinars coming up as well as a deep dive into the holiday season. Um, so, you know, please stay tuned to our social media and emails for that. Uh, but until then, on behalf of Crystal from Candy Industry, my colleague Abel at Susie and myself, thank you guys so much for joining um, and staying with us through this crazy times. Um, hopefully we continue to add value. And until next time, stay safe. And I hope you guys all have a great Halloween and trick-or-treating season. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.